So many of us can remember the first time we ever drove a four-wheel drive. I, I can remember mine very clearly. It was uh, uh, my dad's Range Rover in the Morimi Game Reserve in Botswana. But that wasn't the first time I actually ever drove in a four-wheel drive. That was in 1972. I was 12. It was near the town of Maun in Botswana, near the Okavango. And I remember the whole family jumped into the back of this uh, 109-inch series Land Rover and uh, the, the, boss, the, the, the boss of the camp, the guy who was running the camp, we were staying at a little camp, and uh, his girlfriend was the driver. And she proceeded to put it in reverse and back straight into a tree. My very first time. A couple of days later, we were deep in the Okavango and we had traveled up for a whole day on a boat. It was really quite tedious, but I mean, beautiful country. The, the Okavango is absolutely gorgeous. And this was my first real four wheel drive experience. It was a <clears throat> completely open Series 2 Land, Land Rover sitting in the front seat, bench seat at the front. I was sitting in the middle. And Lloyd Wilmot, he was one of the great pioneers of the Okavango, he's sitting here and he was driving this thing. And we were at a place called Kakaba. And he had built the camp that later became Baboon's Camp, it later became a research camp. But he was building this camp as a tourist lodge and we were one of the very first guests. And in fact, we arrived before the, well before the lodge was even finished. And he was driving and he was showing us his runway, the runway. And driving, at, and I remember it was incredibly rough. I was just holding on. My brother was here and the two of us were holding on. And he suddenly shouted hyena and he swerved like this. And he started chasing a hyena on this open plain. And it was incredibly rough and he hit an anthill woof, like this. And I came out of the seat. I remember so clearly came out, came back, hit the spare wheel, which was in the back, poked my head up and I had somersaulted straight over the seat. That was my first ever experience of the four-wheel drive. And you must know that for a 12-year-old to do that is an impression that stayed with, has stayed with me always. And my, that's where my love of Land Rovers began. Then my dad bought a Range Rover. Then my deep love of Land Rovers continued. But my relationship with Land Rover series wasn't to end there. Welcome to story time. I'm camped. I'm on my own. Uh, in a place called Victoria Rock, Western Australia. And um, the story I'm going to tell you now is one of my really early four-wheel drive adventures. I was driving my uh, Range Rover Classic. This was uh, 1987. It was the year I met Gwyn, my wife. Um, and this was a convoy of three vehicles, uh, my own Classic, my friend's classic. He had a Bahama, Bahama Gold one, and a 1953 2A Land Rover two and a quarter petrol, uh, which became known as the beer truck. And we did a trip, very ambitious, through the Kutsi Game Reserve, which is the southern part of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, and then we followed cut lines. Now in Botswana, this part of Botswana. Botswana was surveyed in the 1960s and surveyors went looking for oil. And there is a grid, 50 kilometer square grid through large parts of the Kalahari. And they literally go northwest, uh, rather uh, north, south, east, west in a grid. And we would navigate using our odometers 50 kilometers, find the tracks. Some tracks were very overgrown, others were less so, and we followed these tracks. And it was a fantastic trip. And we ended up at the Mabusa Hubi Game Reserve, which at that time was unfenced, had no entrance fee, just drove in, and uh, was magnificent. Magn Kalahari at its absolute best. It was the only tough expedition that I ever did with my Range Rover Classic where I had absolutely no mechanical issues whatsoever. None. She just, and it was tough. Very deep sand. And it was, you know, it was rough on the vehicles, but fantastic, magnificent. But the Land Rover 2A was a joke because the owner, Tony, 
had just rebuilt, well, done a lot of rebuilding. He'd rebuilt the engine and rebuilt the gearbox and hadn't quite finished, so it turned out. I remember on one of the first days we were heading towards Kutsi and it was a very rutted track, sandy, uh, corrugated in places, and I remember I was at the back and I had a friend of mine, Dudley, who was sitting next to me and uh, I noticed in the bush a can, a green can. There, weren't any, there wasn't really any litter there, so the green can. Subconscious mind kind of picked it up. And then another one. And, and I realized that the beer truck was dropping beers. Now we weren't very experienced in that. That was one of my early expeditions. We weren't really experienced and we had stupidly tied shrink-wrapped beer six-packs, tins, on the roof rack. Well, within two hours, the shaking had they had torn the plastic and, the, and the, this Land Rover was shedding beers. And this was bad. And I remember char charging through the bush, breaking, Dudley getting out, grabbing one, in the car, oh, there's another one, you know. <laughs> we drove and we chased them, beep, 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 <laughs> And we could literally see this Land Rover in front of us, oh, beer. Oh, beer. <laughs> I was not kidding. And so we chased our beer, we stopped, and they eventually stopped. And we had to repack all the beer. And I remember the first breakdown, uh, it broke down about four times. Um, and the, the first breakdown was uh, something quite minor and uh, Tony and, and uh, John T who's there, a mate of mine, was really good at mechanics. The two of them kind of sorted it out. And the two Range Rovers were much faster on the sand tracks. We would actually just take it easy and just let the, the Land Rover just go ahead because it was, it, it was so slow. And you know, we took it easy. And uh, we come around a the corner, there was Tony, bonnet up, what? Now, um, tinker, 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 vroom, 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 and we would carry on going. The worst breakdown was the entire engine and gearbox had come out of their mountings. Don't ask me why. They'd come out of their mountings and gone straight into the radiator. So the, the fan is made out of metal, right? it's like a heavy metal fan, and it just chewed its way through the radiator. And now this was a mess. And we all got stuck in to fix this thing. And I remember uh, us levering the thing back and we got it back and we, you know, and we had to put some, we had some uh, paste, it was something called Prattley's putty. It was a putty-like epoxy that became very, very hard and you could use it for radiators. And we, we sorted out the radiator, but it, it takes 12 hours to cure. So we had to, tow and it was my job to tow and I was <laughs> he kept on he kept on shouting on the radio slow down slow down I could tow that Land Rover faster than it could drive on those sand tracks the Range Rover was a marvelous vehicle and in that terrain the the the, the Range Rover was so good because its suspension was so pliable so when it you know you, the undulations I had Bilstein shocks you couldn't get uh, better springs for it. I had already had the heavy duty, I had swapped the standard Range Rover springs for heavy duty springs and it made no difference, none. I measured it, no difference. And so I was always overloading and bottoming on the suspension, but I put Bill Steins in there, but, and, and, you know, and this poor Land Rover on the end of this, swinging around like this, stop, 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 we were having a great time. And, uh, we came across a Barclays Bank Land Rover 110 in the middle of the track, abandoned. It had either broken or had run out of fuel. The bonnet was closed, so I'm assuming they ran out of fuel because if it had been ajar or open, we would have assumed otherwise, but we couldn't get around it. This is a two track, two spoor track with steep sa sand sides. Both sides of the track are really steep. To drive up them, you, you can't get momentum. You're at, you know, there, there's the, the bank there, so you, so you can't, if you try and do this, you just dig in. 
it's really difficult to get up these things. And I remember Mark, who was in the front, he was trying and trying and trying, and he got really, really bogged. And you know, all axles, all like the old Range Rovers used to do, all twisted up. And oh, now he was stuck. Okay, I've got to find a way. And I, and I managed to get up by doing it in reverse. Reverse was the trick. And get quite a bit of speed and then swing. And because the steering is now on the back, it swings quite hard, very fast. You don't get the understeer problem because if you try and go up, you get this understeer and the vehicle does this. Whereas if you go backwards and you do this, the, because the, the steering wheel stay on the track for longer, on the hard, they steer for longer. And the back would swing around quite violently. So to be, you could easily roll a vehicle like that. So don't try it at home. Be careful, you can very easily roll a vehicle in sand if you reverse too fast. And uh, this was the way to get up, you reverse. So I managed to get up and I got around, it was very, even the stand at the top was very, very thick, quite difficult to drive through, got the vehicle positioned, tied a winch, winched Mark's vehicle up, then we used two winches, uh, my winch and Mark's winch, to pull the Land Rover and we literally winched the Land Rover all the way around. And then we towed for another hour or so and then found a nice campsite. The other part of that trip that I remember very, very well, I had just met Gwyn and I was pining. I was pining for the fjord. I was actually pining for Gwyn because I had, had fallen from the, for this girl, but she hadn't, couldn't come on the trip with, with me, but I'd fallen for her. And uh, they would say to me, um, it was so quiet, Andrew, but I was only quiet around the campfire because, you know, guess how I was thinking of. And uh, during the day, I was fine. In the evenings, around the campfire, very melancholy. And Anyway. And I remember the funniest story, which just shows you how terrible, stroke, brilliant those early Land Rovers were. You can take it either way. Uh, we were camped at Mabusa Hubi and uh, Tony said, uh, let's go and look for some aardvarks. Now, my aardvark is my favorite animal of all. And they're uh, basically anteaters. And we had come across whole, big holes in the, in the Kalahari dirt uh, where they had dug. And there were obviously signs of aardvark. Wouldn't it be great to actually see one? We went up and the two of us, just the two of us, jumped in his Land Rover and... Um, jumping through the bush, the tiniest little thing this high, you know, because he had these springs on the, it was totally oversprung and everything. And we're jumping through, like this. And we saw one, we saw, it was right there. I mean, they're so shy. And we got an amazing, amazing, amazing look at an aardvark, wow. So we're driving back, driving back, very happy with ourselves. And I started hearing this hissing noise. This it's getting louder and louder and louder. And I said, Tony, what's that? And he just shrugged his shoulder. I suppose he was so used to thing making noises. It's making louder and louder and louder. Tony, this is not this roaring sound. And we're right back at camp. I said, Tony, pop the bonnet. I need to, I need to find that. Leave the engine running. You've got to find out what this is. And he seems completely nonchalant. Oh, it's hissing. So what? I have to find out what this noise is. So open the bonnet. The carburetor had fallen off. I kid you not. There are four bolts on the inlet manifold of the engine. Three of them had lost their nuts or bolts, can't remember. Three of them had gone. One of them was still attached and the whole carburetor had rotated and there was a gap no smaller than that where the engine was sucking in fresh air. And yet the engine was still running. And I called Tony and I said, <laughs> I said, look, I think you're running a bit rich because the gap that the carburetor was actually working and, and mixing the fuel was actually smaller than the hole sucking in fresh, fresh air. And yet this motor was still running. <laughs> so we put it back, got some nuts and we, we put it back. I'll never ever forget thinking, man, 
that is amazing that this vehicle can work under I mean can literally be very 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 broken actually and yet still run well, these modern engines you lose a sensor and the thing just says I'm not working anymore until you replace my sensor so that's the extreme that the two ends of the extreme while sitting at my edit suite putting the story together finding all the photographs and everything I suddenly realized that I have missed I had missed one of the most important parts of this entire story and that was <clears throat> we had some challenges with the Botswana officials now a bit of background South Africa at that time that was 1987 was embroiled in a <clears throat> border war um, with Angola was involved Botswana was involved Namibia was involved South Africa was involved Mozambique was involved. It was, a, it was a whole lot of tension in the area, great deal. And the South African government would send raids <clears throat> into, and had in the previous six months prior to our trip to Botswana, had sent military clandestine raids into Gaborone, which is the, which is the Gaborone, which is the uh, capital of Botswana, <clears throat> France's town, second largest town, city. And kill some people they had attacked ANC activists it was all part of the whole this whole what they used to call the Roy Khafar the red danger red being communistic it was there was a huge amount of tension at the time in the in the subcontinent <clears throat> and we were driving through Botswana as South African tourists now going through there wasn't really a problem we would go through normal checks at the border post no issues on this particular journey, when we were driving through the cut lines, <clears throat> we, were, we, were off, we were off the roads. We were really in the wilderness and driving on tracks that people just didn't drive on. And <clears throat> I remember we were driving along and I think I was in front, but I remember seeing a Range Rover with flags on the bonnet, Botswana flags on the bonnet. Mm, this must be an important person. <clears throat> Turned out, that it was a government minister's entourage visiting his private uh, cattle ranch um, in the middle of the Kalahari. And uh, the officers greeted us quite. I've always felt that about the Botswana people and the Botswana officials. They're courteous, they're professional, they I have nothing but I have nothing but good things to say about them. And still to this day feel the same way. And they were courteous and they greeted us. What are you doing here? No, we're traveling. Oh, that's very, very nice. And then they noticed something. On the top of Mark's Range Rover was a thing called a bowl suck. You can see it in this photograph here. <clears throat> On top of the roof, that's the big brown bag. It had rolled up mattresses, sleeping bags and things on top. A bowl suck is a South African Defense Force piece of kit. <clears throat> And they noticed it and somebody uh, on the entourage kind of pointed it said what's that well when they realized what it was we were detained we were asked to sit on the ground our passports were taken now you must understand that i was never scared for our lives i'd been to botswana enough times to know that this wasn't a problem we just had to get through it and the most important thing is to be polite and help them do their job. We had come into their country carrying contraband, actually. This was South African military equipment. Yes, it might have been just a canvas bag, but that's what it was. So their alarm bells rang. They asked us if you wouldn't mind sitting. So we sat under a tree. <clears throat> we just chatted. And the, the entourage, and they had a number of uh, officers and junior officers and uh, cadets and they were asked to search our vehicle. Now the vehicles were searched to the point where the even the door panels were removed, the, the cardboard door panels on the clips were removed. And every single box we had was opened. Every bag was opened on the ground. The comical thing was that the cadets knew that if they found something that would nail us, 
like a firearm or something, you know, they'd probably get promoted. So you can imagine the enthusiasm with these cadets in searching these vehicles. And they did a job, boy, they searched. They, if we had been hiding something, they would have found it. Almost for sh almost certainty of that. <clears throat> but we weren't. But they found a Jaunty's hat was a South African Air Force, uh, a South African uh, Army hat. You know, they put that aside. Eventually the cadets started putting everything aside that was green in colour, potentially military in colour. And to be honest with you, it was actually quite comical because we would sit in the tree, we just asked, please just let us do our job. And we decided that's the way to do it. Just let them do their job. So they searched everything. When they found everything green, they would put it aside. Anything green. Spade, green, put it aside. Anything. Pair of binoculars. I had a green pair of binoculars. They put it aside. And I remember one of the cadets looking at this pair of binoculars and it was very obvious that he had never seen a pair of binoculars in his life before. Because the first thing he did was look through the big glass end, you know, and said something to his friend, said something to his friend and ah, now and chatter, 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 they're looking at these pair of binoculars. Eventually, and it was, I seem to remember about three hours we were sitting there. It was quite a long time. The officer came back with our passports and said, thank you for your patience. Uh, please understand why we've done this. We needed to check. You know what's been going on? Yes. And he gave us our passport, and I remember it so, so clearly, he gave us our passports back and said, you are welcome in my country any time you like, but do me one favor. You leave that stuff behind. That. And he was specifically, he wasn't looking at everything that was green. He was looking at the balsack and the hat, those two items. And maybe him saying, those are not welcome here. And that particular trip through uh, the Kalahari, Kutsi, the Kalahari and Mabusahubi remains one of the great ones that I have done during my life. I shot nothing but still pictures. I shot no video and I wasn't in the business at the time. I was a film editor working with commercials. So I had no, uh, that's why I didn't carry a film or anything like that. I was just taking pictures like any holiday maker would. I hope you enjoyed my story. If you would like to be part of what I do and help me make more videos, support me on Patreon. Click the Patreon button on the screen now.